Okay, hello everyone. Uh, good morning, afternoon, good evening to you all, wherever you're joining us from today. And on behalf of the entire Powering Agriculture team, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to do so. Uh, before we kick off our exciting presentation today, there are two quick points I'd like to make about how we're going to run the uh, webinar this morning. Uh, first, we'd like to keep the audience muted throughout the presentation, but we encourage everyone to submit questions at any point in the chat box. Uh, my colleague, Mikhail, will be hard at work behind the scenes making sure that the experts receive your questions and we're going to then answer them during the Q&A session. Second and final point, I mentioned I would be quick, uh, we will be distributing the deck after this webinar, so feel free to be present in the moment, take in the remarks from our experts, ask your questions in the chat box, and don't worry about, about missing notes from the slide. Um, so thank you all again for your time today. And with that, I will hand it over to the Chief of Party for the Powering Agriculture Support Task Order, Ms. Janelle Blanchard, to kick us off. Sorry, this is Augusta Janelle before, let me just interject quickly. I see there are some people calling in and we have, I have attached the slide deck to the calendar invite for those calling in so you could access that there and follow along. Okay, thank you, Augusta. I trust everybody can see me and hear me. I am Janelle Blanchard, Chief of Party of the Power and Agriculture Support Task Order, and I have been extremely pleased to support the Power and Agriculture and Energy Grand Challenge for Development over the last six years, working very closely with USA. In today's webinar, we will share some of the learnings that have emerged over the six years of the Grand Challenge, touching on technology, gender and poverty, policy considerations, and access to financing. My hope, and I know the hope of the partners, is that you will consider and, incorp and incorporate the information that we're sharing with you today as you design, develop, and manage your own programs and projects around the clean energy nexus. Next slide. So why did the founding partners of USAID, CEDA, GIZ, Duke Energy, and OPIC come together to focus on energy agriculture nexus? Well, agriculture is really the engine that drives the economies of many developing countries where we all work. It provides livelihoods for some 2.5 billion people, especially in rural communities. And it's the main income earning activity for 45% of that population. As the world grows, the world's population grows, agricultural production will need to increase in order to keep pace and feed the world. Now, much of today's agricultural production is done in rural and remote communities with little or no access to electricity or energy infrastructure. This leads to low intensity agricultural activity, which in some ways further impoverishes these communities. If you can think about the, the small landholding farmer in rural West Africa or rural East Africa, eking out a living day by day in the fields, that's what we're referring to. Clean, affordable, and reliable energy can be used to help intensify agricultural production and really will be crucial, crucial, key, central in meeting the increased demand for food. Specifically, clean energy will help farmers mechanize their operations, add value to commodities through processing, and store fresh produce in refrigerated containers to extend its shelf life. And in doing so, this will improve the farmer's income generating opportunities and lift them out of poverty. Next slide. So why has this not happened as yet? Why is clean energy not more fully integrated in agriculture? So the problem, if we think about it, are two opposite ends of the spectrum. We think of the farmers. There's a lack of awareness about the appropriate clean energy technology. Which solar powered pumps should I use? There's an affordability issue. Can they afford to purchase this technology? There, the, there's the newness or the novelty of the clean energy technologies. And if you are a farmer in a remote area, 
Can I get access to the installers, to the parts, and to the services? On the side of the clean energy enterprises, how do I reach that agricultural customer base that is remote, scattered, and often very poor? Do I have the funds to be able to experiment on the business model or the technology to adapt it for a developing country? Can the technology be transferred from a developed country to a developing country where the size of plots are smaller and things need to be downscaled? And is there even demand for my product because there's a lack of awareness among customers? You, next slide. So using the grand challenge model, the partners catalyze resources and focused attention on the clean energy nexus, clean energy agricultural nexus. And the real focus of the grand challenge was to source and support clean energy technologies that can scale and achieve commercial success. And in doing so, transform the lives of the farmers. This support also increased interest in the nexus and drew other non-traditional actors to the nexus. So in doing so, power and agriculture used clean energy technologies that can be adapted for agriculture with the hope of enhancing agricultural yields and productivity, decreasing post-harvest losses, improving the income generating opportunities and revenues of those farmers, and of course, increasing the energy efficiency within the operations. Next slide. The grand challenge was really organized around four components. The primary component was really the technology and business model innovation focused on design, piloting, and deploying clean energy solutions to reach scale. There's also the access to finance component, which is working with financial intermediaries to mobilize and leverage the donor funds to catalyze even more funding. Mainstreaming and scaling, which is focused on expanding markets and knowledge management, such as today, where we share findings, lessons learned, learned and best practices. Now that you've heard how this multi-donor initiative worked at a macro level, I want to share with you a story that demonstrates how Parin Agriculture supported innovation from early stage to scale. I want to tell you the story of the sunflower pump. As part of the 2013 cohort, which was focused really on early stage innovation, Parin Ag funded IDE, who in partnership with Practica Foundation conducted market field testing of their sunflower pump in Zambia, Nepal, and Honduras. They went through multiple rounds of technology and refinement and finally emerged a pump which could be commercialized. Fast forward to 2015 and Future Pump was selected to receive a grant now partnered with IDE and Practica Foundation to commercialize, manufacture, and distribute the pump. The new grant was focused on growing sales and developing a financial product that was coupled with the pump. Future Pump has now sold thousands of pumps in Africa and has solidified its experience or its capabilities as a pump manufacturer, continuing to refine its business model as well as refine the product from sunflower pump to the SF1 pump to the SF2 pump. Their success has really helped catalyze additional growth and focus on solar water pumps in Africa. As Future Pump continues to grow and scale, they have benefited from bulk procurement incentives that Parin Agriculture has um, provided to help grow the market. Through the global, Future Pump has qualified as a high quality pump through the Global LEAP Awards, and distributors now have funds to further purchase Future Pump and other, uh, other similar pumps. Next slide. So in that story, you see how Parin Ag used its funds to select an early stage technology 
have it be tested in three different parts of the world, have the technology evolve from sunflower pump to SF1 to now SF2, and then grow from selling a few hundred to thousands as the market has matured. So a few key takeaways. The pathway from technology development to commercial growth takes time. It's been over seven years that power in agriculture first started to support this pump. And it's really only in the last two years that we've seen sustained sales. Technology development and business development is an iterative process, both in terms of the technology, adding things like larger panels, remote monitoring, value engineering to bring down the price, and in terms of the business development um, model, in terms of how do we package the pump with financing? What better distribution channels that can we use? I think the third takeaway is that as the technology and market matures, the strategy of powering ag had to shift. So the grant is almost over, but we decided we will continue to, to support solar water pumping by providing these bulk procurement incentives for solar water pumps qualified through the Global LEAP Awards. So even though Future Pump is eligible for supporting this program, we are now supporting other funds, other solar water pumps that are also high quality and recipients of the Global LEAP Awards. So in that story, you see how we went from an innovation in the lab to the field, we, we help scale and then we helped move away from future pump and just support the market in general. So that begins the story of power in agriculture. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Augusta Abrahams to give us another story of an innovator participating in power in ag. Thank you. Thanks, Janelle. Good morning, everyone. As Janelle said, I'm, I'm Augusta Abrahams. I have been the program manager of Powering Agriculture for the past three years. And I would like to tell you another story of an innovator. Um, next slide, please, Caitlin. So this is an innovator. Janelle told you a success, but this is a story of failure. It's a very tragic story. It's a sad one. It makes me want to cry. Um, but I think it's really important to hear this story as well because one of the things that I've learned over the past three years of managing powering agriculture is that I think we need to think about failure differently as donors and especially for programs like this we tend to be very afraid of failure but we need to embrace it because it's really a critical part of this process. So, um, so Simgas was a biogas company they were selling biodigesters in Kenya and other places in Africa. And they were doing a lot of things right. They came to us with a really compelling idea. They said farmers could save a lot of money um, and increase their incomes by preserving their evening milk, which is generally sold at sub-market prices. The, the um, milk, milk is generally collected only in the morning. And so if they only designed this milk product, they could reap Benef economic benefits and it would improve Simgas's business overall because Simgas is trying to find ways to merge um, to increase income so that so that their the farmers can actually afford the product. Next slide. And they were a great company. They were award winning. They won a UN award. They won our one of our um, and we had a showcase a convening for innovators. They won a pitch competition. They were really compelling and charismatic. They were easy to manage. I've managed a lot of these awards now. And Simgas was one that turned their, their documentation on, on time. They had very nice CAD drawings. They were, it was impressive. You could tell they were running, seemed like they were running a tight ship. Um, and they did a lot of things in a compelling way. For instance, they incorporated human-centered design into their design process. They were working with IDEO. Um, they tried to understand the female perspective. One, thing, one of the things that they did was when they found that the milk chiller was taking too much power, too much of the biogas and cutting into cooking and the women weren't happy about it, they re-engineered the milk chiller so that, um, so that they could preserve the cooking power for women. 
And they were setting up local organizations in Tanzania and Kenya to be able to reach people on the ground and really get things going. So from all from an outside perspective, they were doing everything right and they were an exciting company to work with. Next slide. We're now on slide 13 for those of you who are following along on the phone. Um, but over the course of managing their award, something seemed to change. So originally they had applied request, they, they had applied suggesting that they would be able to field test 400 prototype or first stage, uh, first stage iteration of their, of their chilling product. And they approached me at some point during their award and they said, look, they're, they just don't have the funds to do it. They, oh, they were overly ambitious. The, the, the product design process took a lot more money than they thought it would, and they had to reduce the numbers. And so since we're trying to manage these grants flexibly, that's okay. We worked with them. We said, okay, let, what is realistic? We got the numbers. We said, okay, they can do 20. Um, they'll work with a manufacturer in China. But at some point on that process, uh, thing, their, their core business started developing issues and they didn't respond to emails for a while. And finally they replied to me and they said they're going bankrupt. They had these 20 systems partially completed, but they didn't even have the money to get them shipped from China to Kenya. And there's basically nothing we could do about it with the money left in the grant to help them out. Next slide, please. So, um, so that's a downer, but what is it, what is it, what is important about this and what is the important, what are the lessons, the takeaways from Simgas's experience, a company that presumably was doing everything very well and then had ran into these major difficulties. So the first takeaway I get from this is that this line of work is really hard. We have these social enterprises that are striving to make a difference. Um, it's a what I call a high risk, low reward line of work from a monetary perspective. And I think that this makes the I think this makes the successes of the program more impressive. So these brothers, these two brothers started at this company over 10 years ago. Cash flow was a perennial challenge to them. They were educating this market from scratch. Um, and then they ran into this business challenge where they had a product recall. They had to spend several months in the field uh, retrofitting products. In the meantime, they, these, the people who had bought them on credit weren't paying off back their loans because they were waiting for their product to work. And this delay of just a few months was enough to start a snowball of business issues that they just couldn't recover from. So this company that had been running successfully for 10 years hit the a snag, a bump in the road. And because they're running on such low margins, it just can push them over the edge pretty quickly. Next slide, please. Um, the next takeaway that I get from Simgas's failure is that there's no development impact without commercial success through this business, through this model of, through this program model that we have under powering agriculture. So the idea is that we're seeding technology development, but some commercial entity will be taking these technologies to scale. So if this technology has a positive impact in terms of increased incomes, uh, decreased emissions, or what have you, the only way that that's going to scale is if there are successful businesses, um, if there are successful businesses working on it. And that means that they're earning money selling this product because that's the way they're going to be sustainable. sustainable. So sometimes it's tempting for us to ask for more gender poverty, monitoring and evaluation. That was a perennial complaint of my, the ones that I manage. Why do they have to spend so much time submitting results? And in some ways I understand it. They're running this, this low margin business. And um, the more that we ask of them, the more they're taxing the system. And so I think we need to stay focused on the fact that without supporting the commercial success, um, we're not going to achieve any development impact through these technologies. Next slide. And then the last takeaway from Simgas is that I think we need to think about failure in a, in a different way when it comes to these 
programs. So um, when I was, so I, I started my career as a academic scientist. And when I was doing my PhD, I was working on, in those days, I was working on theoretical cosmology. And I went to my advisor and I'm like, all of these ideas I have are, are stupid. Like, I can't, I don't think any of these, I'm not even sure if any of these theories are right. Why am I doing this? Am I wasting my time? And he looked at me in a very philosophical way. And he said, you know, over my career, most of the things I worked on probably aren't right. <laughs> and that's okay, because what we do as scientists is we muck around, right? We're all mucking around. None of us really know if what we're going to do is going to work. But at some point, enough of, get, of us get enough of the things right at the same time that we move the entire field forward. And I think that's what's happening in, in this space as well. So a lot of our innovators under Powering Ag are trying things out. Some things work, some things don't work. Um, but if enough of them are doing it at the same time, it'll raise the entire market forward. Um, an example of this with, even with the SimGas case is, while well, SimGas went out of business, we have, we have now come to support another company through the Powering Agriculture Investment Alliance called Sistema Biobosa that's also selling biodigesters in the space. And I think that they have in some ways benefited from SimGas because SimGas spent a lot of time developing market awareness um, and educating consumers on the, ben on the benefits. And if Sistema now comes in with their product, they can benefit from that work that has already been, that's already been done. Next slide, please. So I, I think that programs that embrace failure are embracing innovation. It's an iterative process. We'll try things, some of them work, some of them don't. We have to be willing to handle the, we have to be willing to handle the things that don't work. In fact, that's a really important part of the process. Um, the program itself needs to iterate. So in the case of SimGas, I think one of the things that was maybe a challenge in how powering agriculture is set up is that we tend to, we have managed the innovators as projects, right? SimGas, I looked at how they are doing on their milk chiller projects, but I didn't really have a holistic sense of their business in general. Um, but through the Powering Agriculture Investment Alliance, where we have impact investors working with us to, in, to uh, identify opportunities, they are able to take a much more holistic view of the business when they're making decisions and delivering support to companies. At the same time, the Investment Alliance maybe doesn't engage quite as early. So there's with or with companies at such an early stage. So there's a trade off and a balance in terms of the different tools we can bring to bear. Um, secondly, I think it's important to remember that we shouldn't, we can't eliminate failure altogether and we shouldn't try to because what it means when we have a company that fails, it means that we've been pushing the envelope. It means that we're striving for greater success and we're, and it means that we're willing to take the risks. Like angel investors, we should consider a portfolio approach. Some of our investments are gonna, are gonna fail. Some might do a okay, but hopefully we'll have a few that win big and together that's what it will take to make progress in, these, in this challenging space. So with that, um, I want to go on and talk about four agricultural technologies that we have supported solar water pumping microgrids with an agricultural load, cold storage, and agro-processing. So the first of these technologies you've already had a little bit of an introduction to through Janelle's uh, case study of Future Pump. Um, and I'm going to start with what I think is probably the most, this, the most mature market first, which is the solar water pump pumping market. It's been around since the 70s. It's a fairly mature technology, but it's really only in the last maximum 10 years or much less that, um, that there's been solutions that are really appropriate more for the developing world and, and smallholder farmers. The 
<clears throat> the impact from solar water pumping is compelling, however. Africa irrigates just 5% of its available cultivated land, and it's the lowest percentage of any con continent. Asia ir Asia's irrigation rate is higher, but at 41%, there's still a vast population that doesn't have access to irrigation. Um, the, there's compelling evidence behind increased agricultural yield and productivity. You can double and triple crop in a single year. Um, you can intensify agricultural production. You can produce higher value crops. Um, we also have evidence that solar pumps can decrease the yield, uh, or sorry, can uh, decrease fuel costs and, and labor costs. The FAO conducted a cost benefit analysis based on future pump, and they found that it had significant benefits for smallholder um, for smallholders over diesel pumps. For instance, they could avoid more than $82 in diesel costs in a year. And there was time savings because instead of, um, instead of having to use two people, which is normally done with a diesel pump, one to hold the hose and the other to manage the pump, you could, um, you could do it just with one person. However, I think a major barrier to solar pumps remains the high co capital costs. And though our companies have tried to tackle that in various ways, it's still a challenge to their business operations. Next slide. We're on, we're now on slide 20 for those of you on the phone. So um, Herring Agriculture has supported seven solar irrigation innovators in East and West Africa, the Middle East and the Indian subcontinent. The innovators have centered around two major themes. So in the first category, we have innovators who are developing small scale pumps for smallholder farmers. Um, and actually selling those pumps to the farmers. And in the second category, we have innovators that worked on developing irrigation as a service. And both of these have, both of these have worked on different ways of making these pumps more accessible, lowering the initial costs and, um, and figuring out a way for, for people to pay those costs back over time. So in the first category, we have your innovators like uh, Future Pump, which you heard about, um, Sun Culture, Kickstart, um, and they all had to deal with how do you make a pump durable and usable and right sized for a smallholder environment. Um, in this way, we have innovations such as solar pumps that are less than 100 watts. Kickstart developed, for instance, a wearable solar backpack that that um, farmers could use to take their um, take the, the pump to the field. Um, and to overcome high capital costs, many of them were looking at financing structures, paygo. Remote monitoring was another feature that, that a number tried to incorporate. So instead, so you could remotely diagnose problems with the pump use it to do better maintenance, use it in the case of Future Pump, for instance, to, to deliver their five-year warranty on the pump. In the case of Sun Culture, they wanted to use remote monitoring to help the farmer succeed. So they thought the business case for these pumps is, is um, only comes when the farmer does well. And so if they can understand, for instance, the moisture content of the soil and the, and the water requirements and remotely send text messages to support better farming practices, then their customers were more likely to make a profit and they were more likely to get repeat customers. So the second type of innovator that I mentioned um, is trying to tackle the affordability issue by offering irrigation as a service. So an example of this is Claro, in India, who was developing a portable trolley system. It was like, it was actually like a little motorcycle with a, a rickshaw with a bunch of solar panels that could be um, could be opened up in the back. And they charged, um, they could charge customers on a per day or per water use sort of regime which was cost competitive with diesel. A similar example is, was in Senegal, where instead of using a portable 
trolley, they used a fixed mini grid, but then pumped water to farmers' fields. Next slide, please. So after six years of hiring agriculture, um, where, where are we? So the good, I'd say we're seeing, definitely seeing the market maturing. When we came into this space, I'm not sure if there were any, but there, if there were any, there were far, few and far between companies who were actually selling pumps in, in Africa. Now we have um, persuasive evidence of growing sales numbers for different various innovators and they're bringing competitors into the market. Um, we see some success with these irrigation service models and financing models that, that innovators are offering. But major barriers remain. I think the price point is still too high for smallholder farmers. In general, our Future Pump and others have complained that if only they could bring the price point down, they could. They think they could get sales. I think the number to beat is a uh, diesel pump is about $250. And right now, the cheapest pump that our innovators are offering is $450. So it's almost double. Um, if they could just bring it down, they're still looking for ways to bring the cost down. According to Kickstart, if they only had five million dollars to invest in tooling, they could do it. So maybe one of you has five million dollars you can help them out with. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise it might be incremental change <laughs> on the price point issue. Um, there are challenges with third-party financing. I'll save. I won't go into detail there because uh, later in the presentation, Jeff will be talking about financing issues. But it's been. It's we haven't seen a large influx of players in that market. And I think a final lesson learned is you can increase income or save time, and but probably not both at the same time. So either you're engaging in agricultural intensification, double and triple cropping and high value crops, but that requires more labor, or you can save time. You can use your pump to, you know, water, uh, your livestock or other domestic tasks or your or maybe easier agricultural uses but in that way you're probably not increasing your incomes as much so with that let me close and now I'm going to turn it over to Hedley Jacobus to talk about um, the next technology thank you Augusta uh, I'm Hedley Jacobus. I'm the Senior Clean Energy Specialist for the Powering Agriculture Support Task Order. In contrast to solar lanterns and solar home systems, microgrids are able to power larger productive agricultural loads like uh, freezers, uh, larger irrigation pumps, and also milling equipment. These agricultural loads both have the potential to increase agricultural production but also increase revenue generation for the microgrid companies that operate them. This allows rural communities to capture more income from what they produce and also increase, increases the financial feasibility of the microgrid companies in their communities. Agricultural loads when on microgrids can also fill in periods of uh, both daily and seasonal periods of low demand, which when producing when a microgrid is able to produce a consistent demand or consistent production, they're able to offer electricity at a lower price. Next slide, please. Pang Agriculture supported five microgrid innovators that are located in East and West Africa, South Asia, uh, the Caribbean, and Latin America. Uh, the technical innovations that Pang Ag Agriculture awardees uh, developed included combination of both solar only and solar diesel hybrid or solar hybrid uh, microgrids and they also used biomass to generate electricity. We also saw microgrid operators developing their own anchor load businesses and other innovators who decided to become uh, product off takers of their own farmer customers. And then finally we also saw innovators diversify revenue using waste waste products from the power generation. For example, Husk Power not only gets power from selling electricity, but they also sell carbon credits, and they also sell incense from uh, the charcoal waste products that are created by their gener electricity generation. Next slide. Please. 
there hasn't, there is no proven business model to promote the growth of small and medium businesses within a microgrid. And microgrid developers are still in the uh, early stages of learning about what works and what doesn't work. What has worked well in powering agriculture has been the hybridization of solar and biomass fuel generator, generators to reduce battery banks and the operational cost that's, that's associated with them. We've also seen operators actively manage demand so that to increase microgrid utilization and to decrease the cost of power as a result. Um, we've also seen microgrid innovators recognizing that solar home systems in the communities that they're looking to enter in or are currently in, not as competition, but also, but as a partner that uh, is a way to augment their customers' access to energy. And we've also seen innovators recognize, stimulate, and connect anchor loads like fish hatcheries and also local markets. However, there have been some difficulties that our innovators have been struggling to overcome. One of the main ones has been that microgrid developers are no longer able to fly under the radar of, of governments. Compliance with local safety and grid code regulations is paramount. This leaves developers open to slow government licensing approvals. One powering agriculture innovator has been waiting for government approval for their environmental assessment for over a year. We've also found that having only one anchor load can lead to volatility in revenue generation. Um, IDE, who is also one of our microgrid innovators, uh, has fish hatcheries on their grid, but their revenue fluctuates with production of fish hatcheries, which is based on the seasons. We've also had multiple innovators complain about the ability to not find, or their inability to find, uh, find and identify and retain technically con uh, conversant operators to operate their grids in these rural remote areas. In conclude, next slide. In conclusion, we found significant differences in the business models between our innovators. One difference has been between uh, innovators ability or willingness to take on revenue, revenue diversification. Some of our innovators simply sell electricity. Whereas we feel that more, more people should be following Husk's model of diversifying their revenue streams. We've also seen a big difference in innovators' uh, willingness to develop anchor loads or anchor load businesses. It's a lot more work, but uh, it's a lot more work setting up a second, uh, completely new and different company, but it helps ensure uh, re revenue streams in the long run. Common findings across innovators have supported the fact that, have supported the contention that microgrid developers are still in the initial stages of stimulating produ productive agricultural loads. Without careful technical and economic analysis, agricultural loads can actually increase the cost of electricity. Uh, characteristics like load timing and startup power requirements uh, can have a huge impact on both the technical performance and the financial viability of a microgrid. We've also found that early adoption with local group, local organizations, such as women organizations, can help facilitate um, and improve technology adoption. Thank you. Augusta, back to you. Okay, start video, unmute. This is like staying on top of my technology here. So the next, the technology that we wanted to talk about, um, and I'd say, maybe approximately third in the order of, of, of maturity is cold storage in the clean energy agriculture nexus. So the reasons for um, supporting this market are the following. Um, we, see, we see great potential to reduce food losses, which is a huge problem in the developing world. Um, at least 30% of global food production is lost post-harvest, and this can be more than that 40% and higher in, in the developing world. Um, a lot of this loss occurs in the first mile distribution between the farm gate and the next collection point. These are areas where, um, where typically the electricity grid is weak, um, or you don't have it at all, and so it's hard 
difficult to bring solutions to poor farmers and poor areas. And there's a need for distributed, potentially distributed technologies and clean energy technologies that can fill this gap and bring things like cold storage to remoter areas. Next slide. So cold storage innovators um, we've worked with, we have approximately nine that we've supported around the world in East and West Africa, Latin America, and India. They you have used a range of power sources, solar, PV, biogas, and thermal evaporative systems. And I'd say they fall into two major classes of systems as well. There's a class of solutions that has been marketed to agribusinesses and aggregators, and a class of solutions that has been designed for smallholder farmers. On the agribusiness and aggregator side, for instance, um, we have Promethean that has been developing a, a thermal energy storage system that's charged through intermittent connections with the grid. And what it can do is that when it goes into a community at a, at a small scale milk collection center, um, it can keep the milk uh, at consistent temperatures by using the basically an ice pack that has been built up over time. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, we have innovators that try to sell directly to the small holders. So an example with SimGas, as I was talking about earlier, um, but also Sundancer and UGA that have developed more small scale, either biogas powered or solar powered um, milk chillers, primarily is what they've worked under, on under powering agriculture. Um, next slide, please. So what is the state of things after, after working on this for the past six years? I'd say the, the good is that we're seeing traction in companies that are targeting aggregators and larger enterprises. So Promethean is probably one of the most successful companies that we've worked with. As of August last year, they promote uh, they've reported over a thousand sold chillers, and these are larger scale, right? So they, so the actual number of farmers served by these chillers are in the in the thousand, seventy thousand, hundred thousand of that of that range in total. Um, they sell approximately three hundred to four hundred a year, and are enjoying consistent revenue growth year over year. So that's very encouraging. There are other models that we see in this space, for instance, cold hubs in Nigeria, in Spiro Farms that are seeming to make a commercial go when they're targeting aggreg aggregators and agribusinesses. Um, it's compelling as a diesel replacement, for instance, uh, in our powering agriculture is finishing a final evaluation and our evaluators have calculated that um, these centers can save as much as $3,000 annually in when it comes to um, diesel reductions and reduced milk spoilage. Um, and the potential for cooling as a service is also interesting where, um, where instead of selling the product outright, instead a company like Cold Hubs offers it for a nominal fee for a small fee, you know, to 50 cents a day in Nigeria to sell, to store a crate of vegetables. On the other hand, unfortunately, even after all our work in this space, I'd say that the market for smallholders has really struggled. Um, these, the systems are, Ex expensive for smallholders. They're, they're 50 to 250 percent more expensive than solar water pumps, which, who are, which we're trying to market to the, same, to the same market segment. And it's just a lot. It's, it's hard to overcome that initial upfront cost, even when there's a com compelling economic benefit, and even when it's com combined with financing efforts. Um, Another issue is that for smallholders, they're really working on, they have to, they're working on behavior change. Whereas aggregators have been accustomed to using refrigeration 
they understand it, maybe it's not economic, but they see why it's a good thing. The smallholders don't necessarily have a refrigerator at home, they haven't used it, they haven't incorporated it into their business model. And so learning all of that from scratch takes more time and is a lot, is something that the companies have to work on in an intensive way. And then finally, I'd say that the customer financing models aren't there. There's been some experimentation among our innovators, but none of them really, um, really trialed in an intensive way. And until something like that comes along, this price point is just gonna be insurmountable. Next slide. So conclusions on cold storage is that the impacts from the technologies are compelling. We see a strong case for supporting providing more support in the space. Um, but the solutions for agribusinesses are doing okay, whereas the smallholder market is a nut that hasn't quite yet been cracked yet. Okay, back to you, Hepi. Thank you, Augusta. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, agro-processing and the agro-processing innovators in our cohort. Um, I'm gonna start with a definition of agro-processing. Um, Way, the way that we define agro-processing is that it's a transformation of a crop into something that has more value. Uh, typically, our, with our innovators, this, fell in, this took the form of milling, polishing, drying, um, pressing, or dehusking. Um, millions of smallholder farmers perform agro-processing by hand, or if, or if they're lucky, they have access to a diesel or grid-connected grid machine in a nearby town. In the case of diesel mills or grid-connected machines, typically they're grossly oversized for the production of a community that's filled, filled with smallholder farmers. However, low-power agro-processing machines can be a better fit for these communities, especially when these are off-grid communities. Uh, clean energy generation is critical to powering these low-powered agro-processing agro machinery so that they, they can be dispersed decentrally located throughout these communities in off-grid off areas. These low power machines can save, time, uh, can save time and operating costs and improve the food, the food security of their customers. Compared to solar water pumping and cold storage, agro-processing is a much more nascent market um, with fewer, fewer vendors and fewer customers. Next slide, please. Powering agriculture supported five different uh, agro-processing innovators. Um, they, they were located in East Africa, Asia, and Oceania. Um, they ranged in power source, uh, so, you know, from PV, solar PV to biomass and biogas. Uh, they differed in target customer, individual versus community uh, customer segments. And they also differed in application, whether it's stationary or mobile. Next slide, please. Over the past six years, we watched innovators uh, develop both good and bad ideas. Um, some of the good ideas that we saw, innovators matching feedstock compatibility uh, to uh, feedstock compatibility of their machines to crops like maize, which provides more consistent utilization over the year. We've also seen creative, uh, creative customer payment options to help end users access payments. One of our innovators, VIA, accepts barter payments in exchange for their services. We've also seen innovators validate their basic business uh, value proposition. Low power, low power equipment has value for those who are hand processing or who are diesel or grid connect processing. But some of the difficulties that they've encountered have included um, including remote monitoring with their equipment, particularly in places where there is no cell phone coverage. We've also seen that um, adding clean energy generation to these small power ag agro-processing machines drastically increases the capital cost. And unfortunately, there isn't a lot of end user finance available for these smallholder farmers that a lot of our innovators have targeted. We've also seen the need for after sales support and spare parts because farmers are not willing to invest in new machinery unless there's a, unless a way to replace 
um, unless there's a guarantee from, from the manufacturer that machines can be fixed or replaced when they break. Next slide, please. Some of the common findings that we have found between the powering agriculture agro-processing innovators uh, have been that although the market is nascent, uh, clean power, low power, clean energy agro-processing machines have a strong business case over hand processing or processing using diesel or grid-powered mills. Customers also benefit from the operational savings and opportunities to engage in income generating activities that these machines will allow customers to have. However, challenges still exist. Uh, business models have to focus on increasing utilization of their equipment, and they also have to address the fact that uh, capital costs are quite high for their customer segment. And we've also found that uh, customers don't necessarily believe that clean energy solutions like solar, biomass, or biogas are capable of powering or feeding the, the high energy requirements that processing requires. And so innovators and vendors have to work hard to convince customers and convince the market in general that their technical solutions can work. Thank you. Augusta, back to you. Okay, so before we, we're going to move on to questions shortly. I just want to talk a little bit about gender and poverty, which were two, which weren't um, direct goals of powering agriculture. They weren't the primary goals, but there were things that we, that are priorities of donors and we considered over the course of implementation. What are the impacts of these technologies, especially with respect to women, female equality, and then, um, and then when it comes to poverty alleviation. So, um, in, so for solar water pumping, I, I think in general, it's a, it's, it's a little bit mixed. In, in general, all of these technologies are gender neutral and that they can be, um, they can be accessed by either men or women and they're not specifically geared towards one or the other. But um, in the case, so in the case of solar water pumping, um, Often irrigation is a female job, so replacing it can be beneficial for women. We heard anecdotal evidence um, or anecdotal accounts on site visits that sometimes women were beaten when they weren't pumping their hand powered pump fast enough or weren't irrigating fast enough. Um, so potentially there's a positive impact there. Um, that, but there might be a negative in the case that women and children now have to irrigate alone. Um, there might not necessarily be a subsequent change in household responsibilities. So like anything, there's going to, there'll probably be pros and cons and it'll be dependent on specific contexts of societal context about how things end up shaking out. Um, and in the case of microgrids, we've seen some positive uh, developments in that the female entrepreneurs tend to tend to reinvest more of their additional income than male entrepreneurs. These are ones that have have started businesses with the electricity generated from from microgrids. Um, it's creating new opportunities in the community that can shape shape traditional maybe disrupt traditional gender roles and, and ability for women to, to engage in um, money-making endeavors. Um, but, and then we have innovators who've been thinking about actively about how do they increase um, the, the participation of women in operating mini grids and, and selling to female households. But they've identified as challenges the fact that they're aren't a lot of women in agricultural or technical fields and there's a male dominance in decision making that um, that that impedes some of the gender equality in this space. Um, in cold storage we see unlocked economic benefits for women product 
products that we are being were being designed specifically with for women and with women in mind there's applications for instance there's dual applications of biogas on the one hand for cooking which is very important and then if you can combine that with um, with a productive use and you could make the technology more attractive to um, for investment right in a way that that women might benefit might be more likely to benefit Right? They might be less likely to invest a significant fraction of their income on something that only helps them cook. Whereas if they can combine that with a productive use, it can increase likelihood to invest. Um, and then in the agro-processing space, I'd say this is probably the, the most compelling in that agro-processing is such a female-dominated task in the developing world. Um, VIA found that women can spend 45 to 45 minutes, that's three hours per day, doing things like hand milling, grinding, dehusking, um, and that by enabling time savings, you can increase, um, you can free up time just for their for personal use or for other productive activities. For instance, VIA set up a system where um, where women could use an agro-processing mill and then instead of providing a cash payment they could spend some of that time creating handicrafts which then VIA would try to sell and use as a way to pay off the mill. So you think it's an interesting model but it's not that but it hasn't I wouldn't say that this has gone to scale yet but it's an interesting way to approach this. On the poverty front um, I think the the takeaway is that the price point with the price point and even with um, sale on finance, companies are challenged in reaching the very poorest farmers. Uh, agricultural intensification, for instance, through solar water pumps, um, takes you need a certain capacity to be able to do that. So. So the very poorest families, for instance, in East Africa will have maybe uh, the, head, the, the male head of the household will be a day laborer someplace. The women are left on the farm, but they have a lot of other responsibilities. They have to raise the children, they have to tend the livestock, they have multiple income generating streams. They might just want a crop that they can plant and leave, let the rain uh, deal with and they just might not have the capacity to in, invest in the heavy agricultural intensification which which brings about the increased incomes and so um so i think it's something for donors to to ask ourselves when we're developing programs that are also using commercial practices to to bring technologies to scale what is our role in subsidizing these technologies for the very poorest farmers and how do we balance those goals with finding viable, um, viable commercial pathways? So let's see, next slide. So just to wrap up, uh, and I won't, it, I just say that the common challenges across all these technologies that we're seeing is the price point. If we could bring down the price point, it would save a lot of issues. End user financing remains a, a big barrier. While some com companies are seeking to do it in-house, others really don't want that dual responsibility of becoming a bank along with being a technology provider. And if there were additional options, it would be very beneficial. There are issues on policy and company finance, which we are gonna have two um, presentations following this to um to address challenges in those space in that space but before we do that um i thought and we get completely off the technologies i've seen a lot of great questions come in in the chat and so i was hoping to address spend a few minutes addressing some of those five minutes now to addressing some of those then we'll go on to the the remaining two presentations and take some more questions at the end So with that, Mikhail, can you um, raise some of the questions that have come in so that Augusta and uh, Headley can respond? Definitely. So we have a few uh, that I think 
definitely could be addressed by Augusta or Headley. Uh, first one for Augusta, um, it reads, on the SimGas case and more generally, could you comment on the role of local context and local expertise in trying to figure out productive use? For example, how many of the grantees supported by Powering Agriculture were local, as in both location and team makeup to the region they were working in? So, um, gosh, I wish I had that number off of the top of my head. We have that in published, we'll be having that published in our, in our final evaluation. But um, I'd say, I think what we saw is that companies that had deep experience in the developing, in the developing world tended to do better. Um, we had companies that were mostly based in the US developing a technology and trying to drop it in, and those tended to challenge, had to have more challenges. That being said, it didn't erase the challenges that companies had when they were when they even had a strong operation in developing context. So SimGas, for instance, I thought they were doing very well with operations on the ground and it, and it couldn't overcome the fact that it's a hard line of work. You can be doing pretty well for 10 years and you get one insurmountable diff operational issue and you might go bankrupt. I have to say it makes me nervous with respect to the coronavirus circulating around now that the monkey wrench that this could be throwing in a lot of our company's business operations as they're, you know, they can overcome a month or two, but if it extends to four or five months, I don't know. It makes me nervous about them. The Next other question. thing, well, I guess I was hoping to, to jump in there. Yeah, jump in there and, and add something to that, which is the concept of what is a local company is beginning to blur. Um, because many companies are, are encouraged to have subsidiaries that are in, well, it's very, very beneficial for companies to have subsidiaries in the markets that they're in. And in fact, the first contract that USAID had with SimGas was with their Tanzanian subsidiary, which was staffed primarily with Tanzanians. Um, and then, then they shifted the contract to SimGas Kenya. But all the time, we were also interacting with uh, SimGas, uh, the, the um, Dutch SimGas entity, which was a holding company over the two subsidiaries. And so I think the concept of, of what is a local company versus what is a, a foreign company that doesn't have market experience or is from working afar is beginning to, um, it, it's beginning to be less black and white, right? Uh, I, I know that one of the founder, one of the two brothers that were founders, one of them was based in uh, the Netherlands and the other one was based in, in uh, East Africa. And, and so there's, uh, it's becoming harder and harder to tell who is a local entity and who is not. Great, thank you. Uh, for the next question, I think we'll direct this to Headley. So it reads, has there been any experience with combined heat and power from biomass energy, for example, electricity for pumping, grinding, dehusking, et cetera, and heat for drying or cooking. Maybe you can touch on some of the innovators that worked on those technologies. Sure, and in fact, one of our innovators from the, two th one of the powering agriculture innovators from 2013 had developed a uh, heat and, heat and uh, combined heat and power uh, system that used biomass to, to fire a boiler that then turned a steam engine and also had uh, process heat. Um, that was uh, a, pro a joint project um, that was developed by Camco and also VIP, which is a manufacturing company uh, or a technology company out of Vermont. Um, in terms of uh, in, uh, outside of powering agriculture, I'm sure there are some, but I, I'm not able to uh, draw any names to mind right now. And uh, one more for Augusta. Um, so the question reads back to SimGas. Uh, would SimGas have been more successful if they had put the time into analyzing the socioeconomic context that they wanted to operate in more thoroughly ahead of uh, launching? Maybe that also brings up the question of what sort of socioeconomic uh, analysis innovators did uh, in, within their grants. I'd say yes and no. Um, 
in general, I think on the biogas front, our innovators didn't do that well at really understanding the business case for um, for milk chilling. Right there, I think in gen there needs to be more work to understand the business case around that. It, they thought it sounded very compelling. You know, you save you save all this spoiled milk, but some of their underlying economic assumptions might might not be quite there. But Simgas actually did a really good job of um, trying to understand the local context. Unfortunately, like they, if of all the innovators, they were doing it the most right. So in their specific case, I don't think that was the thing that did them in, unfortunately. It would be nice to be able to point to that, but that's not what happened. They just had this insurmountable business challenge that when you're surviving on small margins, you just can't overcome. Maybe one more question before we continue. Um, Mr. Headley, so the question reads, how much hand processing is there for maize and rice? This has been mechanized throughout most of Africa for decades. The maize mill was the first mechanization in most rural Africa and nicely addressed the domestic drudgery of women. Um, I think this relates to what we saw, what, what Powering Ag saw in terms of agro-processing innovators and, and how they observed uh, hand processing. So, yes, there are milling solutions, and that's why one of the, uh, that's why one of the things I talked about was uh, diesel mills and grid-operated mills. But when you go into off-grid areas, um, instead of, uh, sometimes the, those diesel and, and grid, on-grid mills are an hour or two hours away by bus. Um, and so frequently what people do is process them by hand. Um, I still see people uh, de-kerneling corn by hand in Kenya. Um, and this is, it's, I think it's more common for people to do that by hand than to have a D kernel. Um, for uh, rice, um, I, you're right, I haven't seen much um, polishing, uh, much dehusking or polishing of rice by hand, but certainly when we're talking about far off-grid areas, things like milling both rice and maize uh, a mill may not be, you know, w close to where you are. And I think the, some of the innovators that we, pr that had a novel business, uh, business model, which is to, to create these clean energy, low power processing uh, machines, were targeting off-grid areas. So that's, that's why we were focusing on them. So I think we're gonna go on, before we go on to the next, presentation, I think I can just very quickly respond to some of these. So, so Arvel, I know you asked about the potential applications for fishing communities. Um, one innovator that we've supported through the Powering Agriculture Investment Alliance is working on a milk chiller, um, or, sorry, not a milk chiller, an uh, uh, ice maker, where the one of the applications could be, um, could be fishing. Um, Sun Dancer that had been working on a milk chiller um, is looking for alternative applications. Their core product is, is a vaccine refrigerator and they just think the solar powered product could be adapted to a lot of areas. Their main challenge though is figuring out what the business case and I'd say Sun, Sun Dancer is one of these companies that doesn't have the greatest connection to a local environment and so help somebody helping them like they're very strong developing the technology but something that someone helping them figure out what the app, end use application is would be very helpful. Um, there were a number of questions about groundwater depletion and uh, around solar water pumping. I have to say it's not something we've studied extensively but I think there's two, there's several different ways to think about it. In, in many places, the solar water pumping is just going to be a substitution for diesel pumps. This is the case, for instance, in India. So therefore, there, there there's no reason to think it would be worse than what's currently going on with diesel. Um, but in other areas, Africa, for instance, there are these small scale pumps entering for the first time what is going to be the impact of that. 
this is not a quantitative analysis, but what, how we're thinking about it at this point is that these are, these are also not infinite pumping machines. They're very power limited. Most of them are low flow. You're only irrigating, you know, half a hectare or something with, with these pumps. And so you're somewhat capacity limited. We need to do a stronger analysis about, um, about you know exactly what the pump density would be per per area but with the small small numbers going in right now i don't think we have to be worried in most parts of sub-saharan africa um and then the last question was around the was around agro um the potential for biogas in general because there was some skepticism about about it and let's see if I can find this question. And I wanted to um, kick this over to my colleague, Christine with the Paring Agriculture Investment Alliance to see if she could um, talk about what she found compelling with, uh, with Sistema Bio Bolsa, which is a company that they're investing in. Sure, great. Thanks, Augusta. This is Christine from Alpha Mundi. Um, and for those who aren't familiar, we have a hybrid structure where we have a for-profit impact investing arm, the Alpha Mundi Group, and then the nonprofit mm -hmm. foundation that provides um, technical assistance to SMEs working in emerging markets. And to address your question, Augusta, around Sistema Bio, and so we are an investor um, through the Alpha Mundi Group in Sistema Bio, and we're also working with them through Powering Ag support on the foundation. And I think they're really kind of four elements to Sistema Bio's model that we found compelling or we find compelling. One is around product quality and package. Um, I by no means am an expert when it comes to biogas technologies, um, but from a business perspective, these are elements that we found compelling. Um, I would say, you know, from a product quality and package perspective, Sistema Bio is one of the first movers when it comes to modular flexible biogas kits. Um, and when it comes to their quality, I would say they're kind of unparalleled in the market when it comes to quality. They have a lot of competitors who use low quality imports from China or ones that are locally made. Um, and because of the more the higher quality um, products that Sistema Bio uses, I would say in general, this translates to about a 5x longer lifespan, better performance and repairability. Um, the second element that we really like about Sistema Bio's model is their service and monitoring. Um, they come in and they provide the installation, they have really strong after sales service, and they provide a 10 year guarantee on their products and systems. Um, the third element that we like about their model is that they provide in-house financing that's very affordable to smallholder farmers and other customer segments that they target. Um, and finally, um, their price is competitor, it, their price is competitive with lower quality systems that don't include a turnkey package or the service options that they provide. Um, so we've been in invest, we've been invested in Sistema Bio for over a year at this point, and we've been really impressed by their their growth um, and uh, their their performance so far as an investee and, and a partner through Powering Act. Great, thanks so much, Christine. I really appreciate you being able to jump in, put you, putting you on the spot like that. Sorry about that. Thank you for jumping in. So, okay, so there's been a number of questions on policy, environment, and company finance. And with that, let me turn it over. We have two more presentations that to go over issues in this space. And then if we're running a little bit late on time, we'll stay open for questions at the end. Go ahead, take it away, Ari. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Marai Monteforte, Renewable Energy Policy Advisor for this work. As you've heard, Powering Agriculture observed that uh, innovators met several policy and regulation barriers that hindered scaling up operations, securing partnerships, and expanding to new countries. And this impacted them meeting their grant milestones. So based on this, the team decided to carry out interviews in a policy round paper to convene clean energy agriculture stakeholders to document these pain points, help to prioritize and articulate these issues and identify potential solutions. And then the guide could then be used by innovators and uh, stakeholders to engage policymakers. Next slide, please. So 
So uh, some of the high level observations that came out of this uh, is that innovators and entrepreneurs are uh, introducing new technologies and business models that hold great promise. And you have heard many examples of this, that the clean energy agriculture nexus in many countries is nascent and straddles multiple sectors, read many ministries, agencies, and actors, uh, and lacks clarity in policy and regulation, and that governors have access to levers to support growth in the sector. Uh, the policy guide grouped and prioritized issues uh, or asks around four topics, promoting ease of business, stimulating market growth, recognizing and rewarding quality and strengthening private sector government partnerships. And then for each topic area, we, we selected those asks that participants prioritized. Next slide, please. So the first topic area that we identified was promoting ease of business operations. Uh, the majority of innovators mentioned that rules and enforcements at borders for incoming shipments of products are unclear. For example, an agro-processing innovator in Kenya noted that although solar PV is exempt from VAT, if a consignment includes batteries or other components, everything would be taxed uh, altogether. Uh, an action forward then is to work with customs and revenue authorities to develop transparent tools and informational resources av available both to agents and companies on products defined as clean energy agriculture. And then train customs and border agents to apply correct tariffs at borders. Another issue was around foreign currency. Uh, working in and converting to foreign currency was often difficult. For example, a cold storage innovator in Nigeria noted that transferring and exchanging money from foreign currency into local currency was complicated and lengthy and hindered company growth. So the ask became to streamline policies and regulations related to access to foreign currency. And if foreign currency is capped or highly regulated, making clean energy ag exempt. Another salient point was to remove policy and regulation barriers to lending and carefully review national regulations that constrain lending uh, or limit pay go um, a linchpin for many innovators. The second topic area was identified uh, as stimulating market growth. Um, lower duties and tariff exemptions were high up on the list as they affect directly product cost. For example, over 30% of off-grid uh, refrigerators according to CLASP. Um, but they also highlighted uh, the design of smart subsidy programs to lower end user costs. Um, innovators were very supportive of private sector friendly um, smart subsidy programs that are time bound and uh, with clear exit strategies um, and very much tailored to consumer needs and the local context. Uh, and many of them mention uh, result-based uh, financing schemes. Innovators also noted the need for market awareness and they felt that they were not best placed to act as advocates for the entire sector in addition to their own products. Uh, next, uh, please. Uh, the, the third topic area that we identified was recognizing and rewarding quality and encompassed the recognition of high quality products, the development of voluntary uh, quality standards, mandatory standards being uh, too premature, uh, and product labeling uh, roadmaps. And finally, uh, both innovators and governments that participated pushed for strengthening private sector government partnerships. Uh, several innovators noted the need uh, to better communicate the value of services they provide, provide to farmers and governments 
uh, and the population at large by employing data-driven research and appropriate metrics um, and pointed to the government, uh, to governments and, and donors as best place to, to help with this. Uh, another ask was to form cross-governmental working groups so that there's a single point of entry uh, for private sector and for the government to engage credible stakeholder groups who represent uh, the private sector views in the policy making process. The full list of innovator priorities and examples of their issues, solutions and related insights are included in our forthcoming paper on navigating policy and regulation in the clean energy ag nexus. Um, this is designed as a guide to empower clean energy ad companies in the engagement of government stakeholders. Uh, thank you and thanks to Gogla and CLASP for their thoughtful reviews uh, and over to you, Laura. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening to everybody. Uh, my name is Laura Sampath and I have been um, had the opportunity to work with this portfolio over the last several years as a business advisor. Um, and one of the things as we were just talking about that we wanted to dig a little deeper into uh, is not just the policy environment, but also how are our innovators and our early stage innovators getting access to um, capital. So if we go to, if you look at the two questions that we were trying to, to answer, um, one is sort of what was going on with early stage innovators and how is it that they were what are the biggest challenges in them accessing private capital and follow-up funding? The Powering Ag support has been instrumental in many cases, um, and we wanted to understand better how to support them moving forward. Um, and then how could we continue uh, to prepare them during the course of the support from Powering Ag to obtain capital uh, in the future? So next slide. So we did a literature review and we just wanted to mostly look at macro trends uh, in current financing markets. We conducted interviews with stakeholders, you know, um, innovators themselves, investors, um, and different program stakeholders. And then we looked at, we found some opportunities to provide support to innovators in overcoming some of those barriers. Next slide. So one of the big things that we wanted to focus on is, is availability of funding and again, recognizing the timing of the uh, webinar today may um, conflict with some of these findings, but at the time of the research, we, re we, we found that availability of funding was not the issue that may, uh, that may change this year. Um, but in general, innovators who were positioned to secure financing did. So we looked, we wanted to look more deeply at how the innovators um, were able to get access to things like investor networks. Um, how could they actually align their profit, profit motive given that they had been coming out of a grant funded environment and, and set them up for getting, seeking follow, follow on investment. Um, despite the availability of funding, there's still, there's a, a fairly stiff competition in the market to get some of the deal flow coming into specific innovators. Next slide. So some of the barriers, um, these are not things that I think that for some of you will come as major surprises. Um, investor fatigue, so um, early investment in these companies is, is uh, a risky business as um, Augusta mentioned earlier. So how do we get investors to understand that their, realize that their return on investment may be a little different than what they had expected given the, the field and the, the sector that they're investing in? Um, we recognize also that early stage innovators need to demonstrate um, a better and a stronger investment readiness. So a lot of them are not necessarily thinking about how to do this and have, don't have experience raising funds moving forward. Um, they also don't generally have enough of a deep uh, network and a financier network. So trying to get them a little bit more access to that. Um, and then this, this tension between for social enterprises, how do they, um, you know, um, balance their interest in profit and impact and sometimes those two things can be at odds with each other. Next slide. I realize I'm going fairly quickly. I'm, I'm noting the time. We're right at the end of time. Both of these reports that, that I'm referencing and also the report, the paper that Arai just mentioned are available on the Powering Egg website. So you'll be able to dig more deeply into this uh, there. So um, some opportunities. So we, we believe that if we could increase the investor pool, 
um, then and by introducing new investors to these this uh, cohort and these innovators that could drive them to have a stronger um, understanding investors have a stronger understanding of how to invest in these kinds of companies um, there's more opportunity for the companies themselves to understand how to, to build their own financial acumen and um, create that digital deal room from the start so that they're able to document and create a due diligence process over time. Um, access to that network, so early engagement of local and regional investors and financiers would be very helpful for these companies. Um, and then ensuring that innovators are pursuing goals and milestones which are aligned with the expectations of their of what they're trying to seek in the long run and again those things tend to evolve over time that isn't something that oftentimes an early stage innovator an early company knows how to balance from the beginning but 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 they can uh, become more mature and um, nuanced over time so next slide so we looked at one of the powering egg companies to try to understand a little bit more deeply how they were navigating uh, the financial landscape. And this again is a, is a case study you can find on the powering egg website. Uh, next slide. So one of the things that future pump tried to do is create an in-house financing mechanism. Um, it's not easy to do. And we talked about this a little bit over the course of today, just recognizing that as um, these, in these innovators were trying to diversify their their offerings. Um, this is one of the ways that Future Pump was, was thinking that they could um, finance. So um, they also realized that traditional enforcement mechanisms for insurance repayments, so for example, in, in many cases, you could repossess the uh, technology. It may run counter to the organizational miss mission and the impact objectives. Uh, Augusta spoke about this a little bit when she talked about um, the challenges that Simgas was facing. So strategic partnerships, or I just mentioned uh, the importance of strategic partnerships, that may be a good solution for end user financing, but ensuring that both partners share those similar growth ambitions and capabilities is critical. I, I know that Future Pump had a lot of those conversations from the start, and those are critical and of critical importance. And then lastly, and, and we just heard from the um, Powering Ag Investment Alliance, a representative from that, donors have a have a a role to play here. So they may choose to support end user financing in emerging markets by providing loan guarantees, first loss guarantees, other forms of market liquidity. And we're seeing donors um, entering into the space more and more, um, and there's opportunity for that to become an even stronger, a stronger place for, for funders. So I'm gonna stop there. I know that we are out of time. Um, I look forward to people digging into these reports that are available on the website. Augusta? Well, actually, I'll, I'll take it back. Thank you, Laura. And I think before we go to questions, I'm going to go to um, uh, the slide that focus on the Powering Ag website to let you know that um, all the information that has been shared today is available on the Powering Ag website or will be shortly. We have um, the technology case studies that were presented. We have three papers on those, including a whole uh, toolkit and report on solar power irrigation. We have uh, several finance and policy publications that are available. We also have gender guides um, that really talk about how do you integrate gender, not only into clean energy um, solution deployment, but into other aspects of a company's development. So going back to the Powering Ag website, poweringag.org, all the papers are available and will be there shortly. We also have your email addresses and I will add them to um, the e-blast. Every time we send out a publication, we'll ensure that you receive them. You know, we thank you very much for your interest and we'll share um, the PowerPoint. So with that, I noticed that we dropped from about 106 to 66. And for those of you who are want to continue the conversation, I will turn it over to Augusta to moderate further Q&A to get more into the policy and finance questions, as well as go back to anything that we mentioned previously. Augusta, over to you. Yes, so anybody who wants to drop off or has to drop off, uh, feel free to do so now, but we'll also hang out here for another 10 minutes to, to answer any additional questions. Um, if there are any on, especially on the policy or financing, um, Mikhail has have any risen to the top 
this point, I haven't been reading all of them. Uh, none specifically on policy or finance, but there's a few uh, still from the technical ones if you want to address those. Okay, okay, we'll stay, we'll stay on for another 10 minutes or so and then, and then wrap it up. So one of them uh, asks, was the project able to go beyond the grantees and identify success stories from the farmers benefiting from these products? Um, this, I think this relates to maybe, maybe heavily from your visits uh, to the innovators, any, any stories that stand out in terms of uh, savings or, or benefits from, from the innovators technologies? Uh, sorry, Mikhail, can you repeat the question? Uh, I was, is it asking about other people who are in developing new technologies that are not involved with powering agriculture, or is it asking about indirect beneficiaries? I was asking about uh, direct and indirect beneficiaries. So uh, beyond the grantees, any success stories from the farmers themselves benefiting from these products, uh, and maybe some examples of, of those benefits. Um, I think one of the biggest innovators that has, um, that has uh, a large number of indirect beneficiaries is uh, Promethean. And, uh, Promethean's direct beneficiaries are, are the dairies that it's selling its uh, cold storage technology to. Um, just a quick recap, Promethean's developed a, a thermal battery that it uses, that it sells to dairies who um, are on the edge of the grid and closer to smallholder farmers. But be, and in India, but when you're on the edge of the grid in India, frequently you have um, power outages that will then <clears throat> interrupt your ability to chill your milk. And so the direct beneficiaries of, of Promethean's uh, technology is um, the, uh, the dairies, but the indirect beneficiaries are all of the farmers that are now able to sell their milk closer to their home than, uh, ha than if uh, the dairy set up an alternative, which is uh, a grid powered uh, collection agency that or collection center that's deeper in the grid with more reliable power. Um, and so that the, the benefits, uh, the number of farmers that benefit that are very huge because each collection center collects a lot of milk. Um, in terms of uh, innovators outside of powering agriculture, I think uh, what we're finding with our, with our work with the financing facility is that there is a whole ecosystem out there of um, people that, of, of companies, um, social enterprises that are working in the uh, energy ag nexus. Um, and, and there are also companies that work in either the energy or ag sector and are interesting in crossing over. Um, and, and so there's a lot of opportunities for us uh, to go forward. And in fact, um, the work for the, uh, the financing facility, the Powering Ag Agriculture Financing Facility is gonna continue over the next year. So their work is continuing and they're continuing to identify more and more uh, potential partners for them to work with. Great, thanks. So let's a, give another question about um, about examples of commercial banks having lent to solar irrigation or cold storage at scale. Laura, I don't know, maybe you could respond to this and if there are any examples from innovators where commercial banks have done that sort of lending. Uh, I actually um, would defer, I know that Carolina is on the call and some other folks, I um, was not the author of the paper, so I unfortunately have less expertise than Jeff Engel, who may have joined uh, to get on there. I, I know there are some others who are deeply working in the space and may have some, some addition to add. Augusta, this might be a good time to talk about Equity Bank, the partnership between Equity Bank and Future Pump. Okay, sure. <laughs> do you want to do you want to talk about that? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd be happy to. So, one of our innovators, Future Pump, who uh, does um, manufacture and sell um, surface solar-powered surface pumps um, across the world, 
the main uh, goal of their project was to partner up with a, a large commercial bank like Equity Bank um, to provide a funding mechanism for uh, basically an asset financing mechanism for customers. Um, that relationship took much, much longer for Future Pump to cultivate than they expected. Uh, I think it was on the order of um, either 18 months or 24 months. And the benefits, th th they do have a relationship and, and Equity Bank does have a lending product um, for uh, Future Pump's pump, but it's only available through a single distributor. And, it, and that distributor limits the, the target market segment that can access uh, the loan because the distributor that they've selected is Davis and Shirtlip and Davis and Shirtlip targets one particular market segment here in Kenya. And so only people who walk into a Davis and Shirtlip uh, branch are eligible to get a, uh, a loan and only if they meet specific criteria that the bank has set up. And so it is a small step as in that that relationship exists and, and Equity Bank is lending but it is incredibly restricted and it's much more symbolic than it is actual economically beneficial. I think the number of pumps that they've sold through that channel is in double digits. There's uh, another question um, specifically tying to uh, investors. I think uh, maybe this could tie to our investment alliance. So the question reads, what are some of the steps Powering Ag has taken to improve deal flow for investors? Also, what type of support does Powering Ag provide SMEs to help with preparing the company to meet the requirements of working with investors? So I can start and then I'll hand it over to Laura. Um, so when it comes to um, steps that we're taking to improve deal flow, I think one of our big experiments under Paring Agriculture is starting the Paring Agriculture Investment Alliance, which was a partnership with two impact investors where we're providing funding to basically bring down some of the risk in the space. Um, either providing more intensive, allowing the investors to provide more intensive support um, subsidizing some of their uh, due diligence and and um, deal flow analysis processes basically it's a for them also it's a little bit of a high risk low return market where they have to do a lot of work to identify the promising opportunities and then it's expensive to manage the investments and so um, donor subsidy in that re respect I think is helping them um, go out and find and target uh, promising investments in the energy ag nexus. Laura, do you want to talk about how you're supporting companies? Yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, from the start, the, the number one um, goal is to try to figure out what is the right company model and what is the right um, venture model for a given innovator moving forward. It is not true that every uh, innovation should have, should be in pursuit of a for-profit, um, you know, uh, company model. In many cases, the strategic partnership might be the right way to go or some, you know, a different kind of way to exit. And so when we work with the companies and we identify that it is, it is a place where the model might make sense to actually be trying to build a company, build the venture and look for investment, we work really closely with the company to look at the due diligence um, frameworks that uh, we know that they're going to need to be um, developing over time and to ensure that they've got, as we mentioned in the, in the paper as well, they've got a deal room and they have the right kind of um, team, the business model, you know, understanding of their market uh, and the technology that, that an investor in this space would be interested in. And we, we um, work really closely. It's, it's a pretty uh, handholdy sort of a, of a relationship so that we are um, providing all that technical expertise, very customized to what each company might need to be building at any given time. And it takes time, as Augusta said this, it's never uh, as quick as anybody wants it to be, especially in our space. And um, as we look forward at the uh, landscape moving at where the economy seems to be heading, and I think that um, we've got even more, uh, you know, have to build out even a longer runway into, into investment and investment readiness. 
So let's do, let's do one more question and then we'll wrap it up. I see there is a question for you, Ari, about how governments uh, can be involved in promoting access to finance for, um, for SMEs in the off-grid sector. Sure, and, and there's, there's several different roles. Um, one is in stimulating market growth. Uh, uh, many governments uh, do this, including the United States. So for example, the United States Department of Agriculture, USDA, provides up to hard, uh, 30 billion in loans and crops insurance to farmers for both uh, to account for crop yield and, and price fluctuations. Um, USDA also provides uh, loans to, to farms and so forth. So uh, governments do play an important role. Um, and so some of the things that boiled up in, in our study was the design of, of uh, subsidy programs that could lend, uh, uh, that, that could lower end user costs. And, and so really, putting a, a high emphasis on, on how to design these private sector friendly uh, programs that can uh, reduce company market uh, entry costs to remote areas uh, where rural customers would otherwise not be reached, um, designing subsidies that um, identify the appropriate equipment to include in the programs and tailored to the consumer uh, in terms of affordability and service and productivity and, and so forth. So really thinking through that, that local context. Um, the second way is to help increase access to finance for companies and end users. So we talked about, you know, reviewing some of these uh, constraints and policy and regulation that could limit uh, for an exchange risk and, and so forth, um, but also in, in finding ways to de-risking de and, and mobilizing investments uh, using different uh, instruments such as what I mentioned in, uh, by the USDA, but in, uh, you know, in, in developing countries in the shape of uh, loan guarantees or, or first law schemes. So one last, this is the very last question. Thank you for everybody being so interested and staying so long. Um, Headley has a compelling response to the question about have there been successes with irrigation uh, ag agro-processing and cooling as a service and um, the related capex burden on smallholders through these products as a service? Yeah, thank you, Augusta. I, I think um, one of the big themes that we've seen throughout powering, powering agriculture, one of the lessons learned is that um, innovators that were trying to sell to smallholder farmers or trying to sell larger appliances to smallholder farmers like uh, Soviet irrigation, like um, uh, cold storage, like uh, processing equipment are struggling in penetrating uh, into lower socioeconomic um, strata, uh, strata. Um, and I think that the one of the biggest barriers is uh, access to end-user financing and I think that uh, service models are the are the way of the future I, I think that um, we had a we had uh, one innovator that we interacted with or that we engaged with and there was one innovator that GIZ engaged with um, and that's uh, on our side Claro Energy uh, developed a um, mobile solar irrigation system because they wanted to deploy irrigation as a service where they can roll up with their with their solar system pump for a few hours the farmer pays them and then they roll up to the next person and every day they they chart out who they go to um, to minimize operation costs um, with GIZ they worked with uh, clean hubs cold sorry cold hubs Cold hubs. And cold, cold hubs uh, is a company in Nigeria that is has a walk-in cooler, and um, you people pay to store their uh, tomatoes or their okra in, or whatever uh, vegetables they need uh, chilled in the cold storage overnight. You know, and what that does is it shifts 
the financing burden from people who aren't able to uh, access financing to people who are much more, uh, much more better positioned to access financing. The corporations and anyone who, an entrepreneur who's willing to start a, a service company is going to be more in a better position to access financing, to be able to pay for the capital costs for this equipment. And also they're, they're going to be able to increase the utilization of, of each piece of equipment, which is also something that we found, which is, is critical. Um, so I, I'm really bullish about how uh, the transition from selling uh, irrigation pumps, selling uh, solar mills, selling solar powered refrigerators as a product and transitioning that to selling, selling the service of that. And, and I think we're beginning to see that in some, in some marketplaces. Okay, so with that, I think we'll wrap it up here. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining us and your engagement. And please do check out our resources on the Pairing Ag website. We produce some videos as well that are very interesting and entertaining, in my humble opinion. Um, and maybe you can lose that in your leisure time now that we're all, most of us are hanging in there from home. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Augusta. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.